Ah, uh, Lego. One of those universal toys we can all remember having played with. I remember spending hours as a kid building countless castles and machines. Now, like most parents, it's the bane of my existence. Being the father of three young boys, I can't tell you how many times I've accidentally stepped on them. But like them or hate them, Lego comes in very handy in describing the structure of the vertebral column. Keep this in mind as we discuss how individual vertebrae stack together and generate movement. Welcome back to the third session discussing the vertebral column. We left off last time talking about differences between individual vertebrae. In this session, we finally put the pieces together. The vertebral column can be thought of as a long stack of Lego blocks. While the architecture changes from one region to the other, the principle remains the same. The inferior surface of each vertebrae is congruent with the superior surface of the vertebrae directly beneath it, allowing the vertebrae to be stacked up. Now, in the case of Lego, the interlocking plastic holds the pieces together. For vertebrae, we require a series of reinforcing ligaments to prevent slippage and dislocation. It's a good thing, too, because stacked Lego blocks? Pretty rigid. Although subtle, the individual movements seen between attached vertebrae are incredibly important for biomechanics. For this third session, our focus will be on identifying and describing each of these joints and associated ligaments and the types of movements that they facilitate. Support for the vertebral column resides in three vertical columns. The most important of these is the anterior column, formed from a repeating sequence of vertebral bodies and intervertebral discs. Posterior lateral to the anterior column are two paired columns formed by vertical stacks of the pars interarticularis segments connected through zygopophyseal joints formed from the superior and inferior articulating processes. Although structurally weaker than the anterior column, these bilateral pillars play an important role in support of the vertebral column in extension and lateral flexion. Between these support pillars, the vertebral foramen we have previously discussed stack together to form a continuous channel known as the vertebral canal, which encases and protects the spinal cord. Finally, note that the superior and inferior concave notches found on the pedicles stack together to form segmental intervertebral foramen, which allow passage of the spinal nerves and vascular structures. When we look at the vertebral column from either in front or behind, the column should appear perfectly straight. If we were to drop a vertical plumb line in the mid-sagittal plane, for example, it should ideally superimpose over each of the spinous processes in the posterior view. The same is not true for the lateral view of the column, where we observed four distinct natural curvatures resulting from the wedge-shaped nature of most of the vertebral bodies. In the cervical or lumbar region, the column bows anteriorly, generating what is known as a lordotic curve. Conversely, in the thoracic and sacral regions, the column bows posteriorly, forming kyphotic curvatures. We come across these curvatures naturally. The kyphotic curvature develops first, from the time we first develop in the womb, curled up in the fetal position. Consequently, these are referred to as primary curvatures of the spine. Cervical lordosis becomes prominent during the crawling stage of infancy, when the act of repeatedly raising one's head to look ahead progressively remodels the cervical vertebrae. The lumbar lordosis begins to form during the standing stage of development as a child learns to project their torso backwards to maintain balance. A great deal of study and research is ongoing on the topic of normal curvatures. It is believed that poor postural habits may put chronic strain on certain aspects of the vertebral column, resulting in deformation, pain, and degenerative disease over time. Ergonomics is the study of efficiency in the workplace and involves an assessment of individual workstations. Modifications based on assessment from a trained professional, such as an OT, can help to minimize these stresses and reduce the risk of injury from repetitive strain. There's a great deal of variability from person to person in the degree of anterolateral curvature, and a standard set of norms has thus been established that the majority of the population should fall into. 
Values that fall outside of these normal ranges, either with excessive or insufficient curvatures, are considered structural deformities and result in increased susceptibility to chronic back pain and orthopedic injury. A hunchback deformity results from excessive curvature in the thoracic spine and is referred to as clinical kyphosis or more commonly just kyphosis or dowager's hump. It's often the result of collapse of the vertebral bodies due to an underlying bone disease or from a combination of low bone mineral density and poor posture over time. The condition can be treated conservatively with physical therapy and bracing, which minimizes kyphosis while maintaining lumbar lower doses. Note that in anatomy, the term kyphosis on its own refers to normal thoracic curvature, not a clinical curvature. Excessive lumbar lower doses is commonly known as swayback and is commonly seen with obesity or transiently during pregnancy when excessive abdominal load shifts the body's center of balance anteriorly in a standing position. Often clinical kyphosis and swayback occur together, as is seen in this MRI image. In a normal standing position, the lumbar vertebrae lie directly over top of the knee joints. With lower doses, the vertebrae sit further forward. Because of the shift, the upper back tends to lean posteriorly to correct this malalignment. Scoliosis is the term used to describe any lateral curvature away from the midline. It typically takes the form of an S-curve. A curvature in one direction is countered by a curvature in the opposite direction as the body attempts to compensate and hold the center of balance over the midline. Often when clinicians, or even the general public, talk about scoliosis, they will state a degree of curvature. This is known as the Cobb angle for the physician who first proposed it in the late 1940s. To calculate the Cobb angle, the clinician first determines the two vertebrae affected to the greatest extent by clockwise and counterclockwise rotation on a radiograph. The clinician then draws lines parallel to the end plates for each vertebrae. The Cobb angle is calculated at the point of intersection between the two lines, and larger values represent a greater degree of scoliosis. In cases of less severe scoliosis, it's difficult to calculate the Cobb angle directly, as the intersection point of the lines runs off the monitor. Well, guess what? Your high school geometry teacher was right. There are instances where all those seemingly useless mathematical calculations do come in handy. Using the concept of similar angles, we can calculate the angle between the vertical and lines running perpendicular to the end plates of the selected vertebrae and add these values together to get the Cobb value. Probably a quicker approach is to determine the angle of intersection between the perpendiculars to get the same answer. Whichever method you use, you should get a pretty accurate measurement of the Cobb angle, or degree of scoliosis. This visualization is also the mental image you should be generating anytime someone discusses their degree of scoliosis. Treatments depend on age and severity. Less severe cases may be left untreated and simply monitored. Braces are used in moderate cases with a Cobb angle of over 25 degrees. This prevents further progression and in young individuals may actually correct the curvature over time. Surgery is indicated in more severe cases with angles that are greater than 45 degrees, particularly in older individuals that have completed growth. This involves straightening and reinforcing the column through implanted Harrington rods. Time to turn our attention to the joints of the vertebral column. In general, vertical segments are separated through three separate articulations, corresponding to the three supporting pillars mentioned previously. Joints between the vertebral bodies consist of fibrocartilaginous intervertebral discs, the structures of which we will discuss in a moment. Within the posterolateral columns, the inferior and superior articulating facets of adjacent vertebrae are separated by small, planar synovial joints that permit a restrictive amount of gliding within this column. These are referred to as zygopophyseal joints. Intervertebral discs consist of an outer fibrous ring known as the annulus fibrosus, which surrounds an inner gel-like center, the nucleus propulsa. The annulus fibrosus consists of several concentric ring layers called laminae, which consist of collagen-rich fibril cartilage. The circumferential orientation of the stiff laminae can withstand expansion when compressive forces are applied to the central core. Sort of like how the belt around your waist prevents your belly from expanding too much after you've been to an all-you-can-eat buffet.
The nucleus pulposa is a glycoprotein-rich matrix, which allows it to act as a shock absorber and helps to distribute compressive forces and normalize pressure evenly across the disc. When thinking about the anatomy of an intervertebral disc, I find it helps to compare it to a jelly donut. We have an inner jelly filling, similar to the nucleus pulposa, encased in an outer pastry shell that's like the annulus fibrosus. This structure dictates the biomechanics of these unique joints. The annulus fibrosus permits a limited amount of both compression and distraction, allowing a mild degree of bending between each vertebral segment in any direction. This movement is facilitated by the nucleus pulposa, which acts like a ball bearing. These combined properties permit a small amount of flexion, extension, and lateral bending. Movement is also minimal at the zygopophyseal joints, which permits a small amount of gliding between the two planar surfaces, generally along a single plane of motion. The mechanics of the combined joints generally permit a small degree of movement between adjacent segments, which maximizes protection of the spinal cord. At the same time, though, subtle movements across multiple segments combine to facilitate large amounts of motion along the column. These motions are not uniform along the column, however. Differences in disc thickness and the orientation of the zygopophyseal joints dictate specific movements at each vertebral level. For example, note that in the cervical region, the intervertebral discs are relatively thick, allowing greater amounts of flexion, extension, and lateral bending in this region. At the same time, the zygopophyseal joints are oriented pretty much in a transverse plane, permitting a small degree of rotation between these cervical segments. In the thoracic region, the relatively thin discs and coronally orientation of the zygopophyseal joints allow very little appreciable motion. The intervertebral discs are once again thicker in the lumbar region to allow, once again, flexion, extension, and lateral bending, but the orientation of the zygopophyseal joints in the sagittal plane allows very little rotation between lumbar vertebrae. This radiographic image provides a clear visual depiction of segmental versus whole column movement. We have what is clearly a contortionist demonstrating an extreme degree of back extension. Note, however, that despite the large degree of extension in the column, extension at each individual segment is subtle, and extension in the thoracic region, like we just talked about, is almost non-existent. Support for the vertebral column comes from numerous ligamentous bands that reinforce individual or multiple intervertebral segments. The anterior longitudinal ligament runs vertically along the anterior aspect of the vertebral bodies and provides the only soft tissue resistance to hyperextension of the vertebral column. A similar band of connective tissue, the posterior longitudinal ligament, runs vertically along the posterior surface of the vertebral bodies, where it provides resistance to hyperflexion of the column. Hyperflexion is further resisted by both the supra and interspinous ligaments, which limit separation of the spinous processes. Although not seen in this diagram, intertransverse ligaments span between transverse processes in a similar fashion, which serve to primarily limit lateral bending and rotational movement between vertical segments. Finally, located between the lamina, we have the ligamentum flavum, the so-called yellow ligament, due to its color. Its yellow tinge is due to the high concentration of elastic connective tissue seen in these ligaments. They serve more as rubber bands than ligaments in the traditional sense, assisting with passive recoil between vertebral arches following spinal flexion. To gain a better appreciation for the vital role that these joints play in normal movement, consider the medical condition ankylosing spondylitis. This is a type of rheumatoid arthritis specifically affecting the zygopophyseal joints and fibrocartilaginous joints between the vertebral bodies. Over time, chronic inflammation results in fusion of the articulating surfaces and loss of joint mobility. This results in a progressive and irreversibly rigidity in the spinal segments, a condition commonly referred to as bamboo spine. It could be thought of as like being strapped to a backboard to immobilize the spine. Here we see some brain film radiographs of individuals suffering from ankylosing spondylitis. Notice in the lateral and anterior view of the patient on the left that there is incomplete separation of vertebrae due to fusion. In the AP view of the patient on the right, the fusion that occurs between spinous processes results in, con in a continuous radio-opaque line down the middle of the vertebrae, which is commonly referred to as the dagger sign. 
due to the resemblance. Two articulations that require special consideration are the atlanto-occipital and atlanto-axial joints due to the unique biomechanics and movement seen in this region. The superior articulating facets of C1 are condyloid in structure, allowing flexion and extension between the atlas and the base of the skull, but no rotation. The unique orientation of the dens with the anterior arch of C1 and the planar orientation of the zygopophyseal joints permits a large degree of rotation between C1 and C2 vertebrae, accounting for the majority of rotation in the cervical region. A number of specialized ligaments reinforce the first two cervical vertebrae and the base of the skull. Viewing the posterior surface of the vertebral bodies with the arches and spinal cord removed, we can see the posterior longitudinal ligament as it inserts on the internal surface of the occipital bone. In this region, it is known as the tectorial membrane. When the tectorial membrane is stripped away, some additional specialized ligaments are observed. The cruciate ligament is so called because of its cross-shaped appearance. The transverse band, in particular, is important in stabilizing the atlantoaxial joint. It spans from one side of the C1 vertebrae to the other to prevent posterior dislocation of the dens into the vertebral canal. You can think about the transverse band as serving the same function as your hands anytime you lean back and rest your head on them. In this position, you're able to relax your neck flexors because your hands are preventing your neck from hyperextending. If you were to let go, however, your head would flop backwards. This is exactly what happens clinically. Rupture of this ligament is almost always associated with a posterior shift of the dens and traumatic spinal cord injury. Note the space between the anterior arch and the dens. In this instant, the patient was involved in a motor vehicle accident and suffered spinal shock and quadriplegia. Unfortunately, she passed away three days following the accident, despite best efforts to keep her alive. Deep to the cruciate ligament, we see the alar ligaments, which connect the dens directly to the base of the skull, preventing excessive rotation of the skull and atlas relative to the axis. You can demonstrate the function of the ligament by bringing your arms forward and grabbing onto both ears. If you can imagine your head being the dens, your arms would be the alar ligaments. There's a little bit of give that allows you to rotate your head still, but it's pretty limited. This is how the alar ligaments limit the amount of rotation of C1 about the dens. Tearing of one of these ligaments may not necessarily result in immediate damage to the brainstem and spinal cord, but the resulting instability would leave the patient susceptible to neural damage, in particular with excessive rotational movement. Okay, so up to this point, we've been talking about anatomy and some relevant clinical presentations related to the anatomy. In the final session, we'll finish off with a look at some additional types of injuries. See you after the break.